ഡയറിയ Uh, most commonly as the first symptom there are many questions related to gastroenterology practices right now and what is actually the real message that a gastroenterologist should know if a patient is arriving to him regarding the symptoms of diarrhea in such a period what should be done now so for to discuss all this we have a eminent faculty with us and uh, he is dr sakib ahmed uh, he is joining us live from uk uh, he is a mrcp in medicine mrcp gastroenterology also he has done frcp and more importantly most important uh, that is uh, he is a fellow of european board of gastroenterology and hepatology currently he is working as a consultant gastroenterologist and advanced endoscopist uh, endoscopist at sherwood forest hospital uh, which is a nhs trust hospital so i welcome you sir on board uh, thank you for joining us and taking time out out, out of your impo- very busy schedule it's a pleasure how are you sir I'm fine. Thank you very much, uh, Naman, for kind introduction. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, I will just uh, hand over the floor to you, and you can start with your presentation. Uh, and later, uh, at the end of the part, uh, we will have question and answers from audience, and I have few questions for you as well. So we'll be asking those. Uh, you can uh, share your presentation now. Sure. Um, so I hope you can uh, see the slides now. Is is that uh, visible? Uh, no, we cannot right now. Okay, let's just uh, let's try this time. Yes, we can. We can. Okay, so um, Bismillah Rahman Rahim. Thank you very much, uh, Naman. And uh, as you've already introduced, the aim of talk today is actually to concentrate on the GI aspects of COVID-19. And uh, so I will try to go through this uh, and under these headings a little bit of. Uh, history about covid which we already know but some uh, some basic interesting facts some uh, data about what uh, gi manifestations covid has had and how to worry about immunosuppressed uh, states uh, a brief uh, introduction about covid and liver disease uh, which is in fact itself is a big uh, topic and needs a separate discussion some highlights we need to know about endoscopy in this era and foremost and most important is uh, safety not only of your patients but uh, doctors as well the woman who discovered the first coronavirus uh, was actually dr julia almedia and she's from scotland she left her school at age of 16 and went to st thomas hospital as a lab technician this is the same hospital where, where boris johnson got admitted in itu for a few days uh, she later did doctorate uh, and uh, discovered this coronavirus in 1964 she in fact died uh, three, in 2007 and little she would know that after 13 years of her death her discovery has caused havoc in the world and especially for the doctors in the same hospital uh, are struggling to catch uh, control this disease the history dates back uh, to actually muslim heritage it was abu ali sina uh, as we know him who suspected that some diseases are actually spread by microorganisms and the way to prevent human to human contamination and treatment was in fact isolating these people for 40 days um i don't know why he came with the figure of 40 days but that's his method was called arabenia the 40 and once some uh, interestingly when some traders from venice went they adapted this method as well to successfully treat this disease and they called it quarantina which means 40 in italian and uh, and it, i think the number 40 still holds true because most of the effective quarantines have been for effectively for 30 to 40 days which has broken the the peak of this disease especially in italy the venice is also one of the worst effective areas so um, covid 19 uh, this is what i call is a cycle of death uh, we all uh, take it as a respiratory disease and that's the main and the cornerstone of this uh, effect is our uh, now the as the things are getting more clear it can affect multi organs it can uh, from lungs it can uh, cause myocarditis the body itself the 
response, which is called cytokine storm, can cause more effect on kidneys. It can also affect liver, GI tract, and the secondary sepsis and hypoxemia is also a killer. And that is a problem. It is a multi-organ failure eventually, which kills the patient along with the respiratory compromise. Where does GI stand here? Before we go there, I would like to discuss this a real case which uh, happened in our hospital almost about a week, 10 days ago. Uh, we had this nine, uh, 29 year old uh, young lady who was referred from a &E. She had been unwell for two days and her main symptom has been nausea, which was followed by projectile vomiting. On inquiring, she also had some abdominal pains and discomfort and felt a bit bloated. A blood test showed dehydrated, her urea was red, she had electrolyte abnormalities, highlighting hyponatremia, some metabolic acidosis, and low potassium as well. It was thought that uh, she probably has small bowel obstruction and hence was referred uh, to surgical colleagues. Uh, and this is her CT scan. I would like to highlight the fact that now all the patients coming under surgeons, we are aiming to do CT, whole body, CT chest, including CT abdomen, and you will see the reason why. So uh, here you go, that's the start. You can see the chest coming up. And did you notice the peripheral consolidation uh, starting from the periphery of the lung, patchy ground grass appearance? And effectively, this lady has COVID-19 without any respiratory symptoms. Uh, she was transferred uh, from a surgical ward to COVID-19 ward. But by that time, she already been in the hospital for a day and a half. She had been through any through normal medical admission ward. She, a lot of people has been exposed to it. And this highlights the importance of the point that we need to know that COVID-19 is not just only a respiratory disease. Uh, sorry about the poor quality of this slide, but it, it, it serves the purpose which I'm trying to highlight is the frequency of COVID-19 patients with or without digestive symptoms. As majority, the green highlights is, is the presentation with, with respiratory symptoms, which include cough, fever, and especially dry cough. Uh, runny nose actually is not a symptom of COVID-19, and they don't really have classical flu-like uh, symptoms, but dry cough, fever, and myalgias are very important. Fatigue is a very important component of that presentation. However, if you see 45% of those people along with respiratory has some di digestive as well as respiratory symptoms. We'll come later what digestive symptoms they have. The more important to know is 10% of these people actually have no digestive or respiratory symptoms. And 3% of these people have only digestive symptoms with no other symptoms at the initial presentation. The later, when after 40, eight to 72 hours, this uh, figures change and majority do develop fever in 90 to 100% of the cases. And a very cornerstone symptom of COVID-19 is extreme fatigue and myalgia. So initially, if you have people coming with diarrhea, they might not necessarily have fever or myalgias, but if you wait 48 hours, they will certainly, almost certain to develop these symptoms as well. So what are the GI symptoms of COVID-19, uh, which uh, this answer has been uh, uh, this question has been answered by a meta-analysis from my friends uh, from China. This is uh, from Hong Kong, and Dr. Wang uh, kindly shared this data with us. It's actually been presented in the Journal of Gastroenterology this month. Uh, I'm not sure it's been done yet or not. So according to his uh, cohort, he analyzed uh, about uh, 4,243 COVID-19 patients and different studies, GI symptoms, were present in about 18, 17, 2.6 or 18% of cases. And the most common symptom, about 27% uh, was anorexia, which is loss of appetite initially. And followed by that is diarrhea. So the most common reason people might contact you is loss of appetite. Along with that, the also very initial symptom is loss of smell and taste. And this, should alarm you to suspect that these patients might have COVID-19 rather than usual GI infections. The, after diarrhea, the nausea and vomiting is also a prominent feature of this, uh, this uh, disease. And it's important because vomiting makes them dehydrated uh, quite profusely. I had three patients in the last uh, one week whose main symptom was vomiting. 
along with fever. They went uh, dehydrated, they developed kidney injury. They also had electrolyte abnormalities. And throughout their two week, uh, uh, throughout their uh, about 10 days stay in the hospital, they still have vomiting ongoing and they needed to be fed uh, by alternate routes because they couldn't really keep anything down. So it can be so profound, although the, the, the number of these patients are minority, but it is worth knowing. The next uh, important symptoms is abdominal pain and discomfort. Severity to your pain is not that severe as you get with, no, uh, with, the, with the abdominal pathology itself, but it's nevertheless, it is there. Sometimes it's a continuous pain. It is not actually peritonitic. If you examine their bellies, uh, which I do not recommend, uh, they, do, do, they do not have peritonism. They do also sometimes complain of dyspepsia and discomfort as well. And in his cohort, viral RNA was detected in stool of about 15 to 60% of these patients. And that include patients without GI symptoms, which were more alarming. Now this has, let's go to the next slide. This, this slide has been previously shown as well in, in recent webinars. And I think it's very important uh, to know this. This is again a study from uh, China. They had about 75 patients uh, and they did stool testing viral swabs and symptoms from the start of the disease. So the little triangles represent when they started to have their COVID symptoms, which could be any symptoms. The small small uh, round red dots indicate when they got admitted to the hospital, and the red line indicates when their RNA nasal swabs got positive. I would like to highlight the nasal sensitivity of nasal swabs is about 67%, so you can still miss one third of the cases of COVID-19. All of these patients also had their stool RNA checked on day two and day three, and, and they continue doing that during their admissions. So if you concentrate just on the first bar, so this patient got admitted on 30th of January. He had a positive nasal swab on 31st of January, which became negative after almost a week on 6th of February. But you can see his stool test, which is a yellow bar, remained positive till 9th of March, really almost a month after he was, he was discharged, his stool test was still positive. And then according to their cohort, the maximum uh, uh, days they recorded stool positive RNA was 47%, 47 days, 47. So your RNA on average uh, can be positive from day 10 to day 47. The mean of those duration is about 29 days. The important of this is that once you've been discharged from hospital and your respiratory symptoms are settled, your nasal swab might still be negative, but you still can be a spreader of the disease because you're shedding virus in your feces. So you should instruct your uh, patients when you're discharging them that they, sh they should have strict toilet hygiene at home. Best to separate if they can, have different, uh, use different toilets from the family members. It's very important, as been I cannot emphasize enough, is to hand washing after using with 20, minutes, 20 seconds at least with soap and water, and then thoroughly cleaning the area as well, because this is how the household would get infected. So let's move on. So why GI symptoms are important? I think I've already highlighted why they're important because they are actually some can be atypical presentations. Along with that, they have prognostic implications. It's been now well documented, the people who present with GI symptoms have more severe disease, they have longer duration of hospital stay, and they're more likely to end up in ICU uh, comparatively to the people who don't have uh, uh, GI symptoms uh, of the disease. And again, um, uh, my friend from Hong Kong, uh, Dr. Wang reported that abdominal pain was more frequent in patients who required ITU admissions than who do not have abdominal pain. So it's worth noting the importance of these uh, symptoms. So let's come, come to the other aspect of uh, G, our GI practice, uh, which I take it is, uh, is, uh, is not that big in Pakistan, but in UK is, is, is the bulk and butter of, uh, uh, bread and butter of a GI practice is IBD and Crohn's and colitis. And I think uh, all enthusiasts should read this uh, paper, which has been uh, published in gastroenterology uh, last week. And this is a 
and they give you some valid uh, information. So good news is that having IBD, either Crohn's disease or colitis, does not increase your risk of becoming infected with, Crohn's, with the SARS COVID infection. It is safe to continue to receive infusions if they are on anti-TNF uh, uh, in infusion centers. Uh, the hospitals need to follow the strict protocol of hygiene, hand washing, and uh, isolation. Uh, I will come to the next slide, but what they found out was it's, it's probably appropriate to discontinue prednisolone. That is the only independent medicine which increases the risk of having catching this COVID virus infection. Uh, it's probably inappropriate to reduce the dose or stop other IBD therapies to prevent them from COVID infection. Lymphopenia is associated with high mortality in uh, COVID-19. And that is to make you aware that azathioprine has effect of lymphopenia, so something you must uh, keep in mind. The safest of infusions were widow and you stick in that. At one point, there was a debate whether uh, anti-TNF agents are actually protective uh, because one of the mechanisms you get uh, body injury from COVID-19 is a cytokine storm. But now it's well established that actually not TNF uh, tumor necrosis factor mediated is actually interleukin-6 mediated uh, uh, response. And uh, anti-TNF uh, has probably no role in protecting that body damage. So I think it's very important to know half-lives of IBD medicines because that has got implications. What they propose is that in general to, to, to get, you need five and a half half-lives of the medicines to reduce the required level of drug very low in your blood to, to say that you're safe out of their, of, of their effects. For example, the corticosteroids, whether prednisolone or high hydrocortisone has half-life of 24 hours. So if you're given a patient medicine on today, multiply this 20, 24 with six, so it's almost after a week, that effect of this medicine on your body will go away. So your immunosuppressed state will stay for a week from using your penicillin today. And that has a lot of implications because not all medicines have the half-life of a day. Some of them like ustikimab is 20 days or vidalizumab is 25 days. Average of, uh, uh, the, of uh, methotrexate is six to seven hours. So if you stop your meds, the, their medicines now, for example, if you stop their um, Humira at uh, now, they still will be have immunosuppressed state for another uh, another 40 days at least, or to or for the next two months. So so it's probably no use to stop these medicines to prevent them from COVID infection. But it is important to stop them if they do get COVID-19 infection. This is very um, interesting slide, um, and it's uh, is the level of statements. I don't know how clear it comes out. So red, you have to read this slide in 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 relation with the statements given on the left side. So red indicates it's uh, inappropriate, and green means appropriate. It makes it a little bit confusing, but I will explain. So for example, if we go to the statement first, the therapy, the number one, the therapy increases the risk of getting the inf infection with COVID-19. So five essays, budesonide are inappropriate. It means they do not increase the risk of getting COVID-19 infection. But if you look at prednisolone with the dose more than 20 milligrams per day, it's green in all these statements. It means prednisolone dose more than 20 milligrams per day increases highly likely of getting the viral infection, which is a known fact. And for that matter, it predisposes your patients to get COVID-19. Similarly, anti-TNFs or orange, they are probably does not increase the risk of having infections, but the recommendation is to stop them if the people do get COVID-19, or if anyone in their family or they have been exposed to someone who's got COVID-19 infection. Uh, the safest of all, which coming out of these uh, medicines is vidozumab and Estikimab. The question which is interesting and hasn't been answered is, what if you have acute flare of uh, colitis uh, of a known patient presents to you with colitis, whether they have COVID-19, which is called this colitis. There's been a case report from New York regarding this, or whether it's a, a de novo IBD flare up, and how would you manage, Would you should you manage them with the similar pathways we use, IV hydrocortisone, or give them high dose steroids, or should you just directly go to the safest medicine, which is vidozumab and stekimab? 
in this COVID era, what approach I I tend to use is, is try not to admit them if it's possible. To of course do the basic stuff, make sure the electrolytes is normal, they're not dehydrated. If they need IV fluids, give them. Use lower dose of steroids if possible, less than 20 milligram per day. However, if they're having a swear IBD flare, I think it's important to directly go for an agent like vitazolumab or stikimab along with low dose steroids and see how they respond. And the rule of the thumb remains the same. If there's no improvement in by day three, you should uh, consider early surgery and collect me rather than waiting for a long period of time. In our um, area, we do tend to now get their CT chest. As I explained earlier, this most sensitive test to to uh, detect early COVID infection is a CT scan of your chest, which which has sensitivity about 97%. Your nasal nasal pharyngeal swabs have sensitivity of 67%, mean one third of cases you will miss. So in nutshell, management of IBD during COVID-19 pandemic is uh, they should continue their medicines and infusions as they're on. IBD doesn't appear to increase the risk of COVID-19 infection. However, uh, if the people do develop fever, respiratory symptoms, please discontinue their uh, uh, steroids, their tofacinab and anti-TNF. You can continue them on budesonide and ASAs. It's, uh, it's important that you should submit the cases to IBD registry if you have one. So what about COVID-19 and liver? It's, it is, I think, is the most uh, interesting aspect of, uh, of COVID-19 is the liver disease. Uh, the most of the data for COVID-19 and liver is actually from your previous uh, SARS virus infection and a lot of uh, things have been explored from that. Uh, COVID-19, uh, the good news, in fact, is that uh, the, the, all the data from China as well as from Italy doesn't suggest that people that uh, chronic liver disease have decompensations to acute liver failure. And it per se, and, and de novo, it doesn't increase the, the, their mortality as such. So having a cirrhosis of liver doesn't necessarily mean you will have more severe infection of COVID-19, but, uh, but at the same time, it does put, put you in a high risk category, so you should avoid strict uh, isolation measures. Um, so liver impairment is common in viral infection. It's not only COVID-19, as we know, people with Epstein-Barr virus, with Sartellomagarovirus, other viruses, they do get liver impairment. And part of that is because of uh, cytokine storm you get, the interleukins, the various cytokines your body releases and try to fight the infection. Uh, in fact, uh, impairs liver function, which is called bystander hepatitis. Uh, as I suggest, from the most of the data is from previous SARS infection, about 60% of patients had liver impairment on their liver biopsies, and which in fact uh, demonstrated viral nucleic acid and de novo viral injury to the liver. More recently, about 54% of patients admitted in hospitals in China had COVID-19 induced liver, abnormal liver function test. Majority of them have mainly more gamma GT than ALT. And the, the, the reason for that being is ACE2 receptors are more pre present in your uh, cholangiocytes rather than the hepatocytes. And hence, uh, uh, we now know it's established that COVID-19 has affinity for ACE2 receptors. And that's why they are found in respiratory tract, your cholangiocytes, duodenum, upper GI, as well as small bowel. And in certain cases, they say it's present in colon as well. Um, that that discovery of ACE2 receptors led to that debate about, if you remember, about stopping ACE inhibitors in people who take uh, hypertension, uh, producing a high risk of COVID infection. Uh, the theory has been abandoned because it's not enough data to prove that. So people should carry on their antihypertensive medicines, which are ACE inhibitors. They are basically based at ACE1 receptors. And the theory was that blocking ACE, ACE1 receptors will upgrade ACE2 receptors, but there's no concrete proof for that. Important bit to know is the raised ALT from, there's another meta-analysis from Hong Kong, which predicted as a poor prognostic indicator, along with low platelets in, uh, and, and uh, albumin. So in fact, it wasn't the respiratory disease or respiratory failure, which was coming out as a poor outcome measure, which probably is, but it was raised ALT, which was an independent factor predicting their mortality. The interaction between existing liver disease and COVID-19 has no, 
has not been well studied. However, we know that uh, it does not uh, cause uh, liver decompensation as such. Uh, especially in Pakistan, people with hepatitis B or hepatitis C, you can reassure them they are not as at risk of uh, having increased severe COVID infection. Their risk is same as as general public has, uh, and there's minimal interaction between COVID-19 and hepatitis B or C. In fact, if there is no studies proving there is any interaction at all. This is a bit uh, a busy slide, but uh, it divides people from the easel, it divides people with chronic liver disease, people with decompensated liver disease, and people with hepatocellular cancer. The message from this slide is, is try to do minimum for them. If possible, try to avoid visiting to the hospitals. Important is to have look after these patients by teleclinics. You can postpone, for example, uh, routine monitoring of their ultrasounds, fibro scans. I think the yield of those tests are low in such scenario rather than uh, rather than calling them to the hospital to have this test, which increases their risk of getting the infections. Uh, patients with autoimmune liver disease are particularly at risk because uh, they are on immunosuppressive medicines and they are on steroids. The uh, current recommendation is, is to continue their current treatments. Important is they have strict isolation measures. They should wash their hands frequently and avoid uh, contact uh, uh, with people as much as they can. Uh, it also emphasized the importance of vaccinating them against pneumonia and influenza to prevent secondary infections, which will make them visit the hospital. Now, COVID-19 has been the biggest uh, threat to the liver transplant uh, programs all over the world. Uh, th th although the, the transplant is still going, but I think people have apprehensions uh, on both sides. The patients will be on the immunosuppress pathway, as well as exposing them to the hospital environment and secondary infections which can cause increased mortality. So it's all balanced between risk and benefits. If you need transplant and your mortality is high from that, then you should go and have your transplant, but have strict precaution measures taken as well. So what happens with the, with the people who already have transplant for years, for example, five years, 10 years ago, are they at, at increased, increased risk because they are on immunosuppressants like cyclosporine or tetralimus, or for that matter, some people will be on azathioprine. So the data is very uh, limited. However, this interesting um, study from Lombardy, which is the epicenter of uh, COVID-19 infection in Italy, they had a population of 10 million and had about 10,000 people dying of COVID-19 infection. I think the reassuring bit is, is they had about 111 long-term liver transplant patients who were survivors. They were transplanted about 10 years and out of those 111, three, only, only three people have died in the past three weeks. So if you look into this context of three people dying out of about eight to 10,000 deaths in that area, I don't think it's significant as you can reassure your transplant patients that they are safe. The, all the patients who were unfortunately died were male. So male being male puts you at a higher risk. They were older, more than 65 years of age, and they have the period the typical problems you get post-transplant. They had high BMI, they had hyperlipidemia, they had diabetes. So basically they had metabolic syndrome, which we know that increase your risk of getting high mortality with, with, uh, with COVID infection. So basically it's the post-transplant metabolic complications which increases your risk, not in fact you're having a liver transplant and on, being on immunosuppression. And that's why you need to be your follow the strict isolation protocols, try to avoid going out, uh, preferably pray at home, wash your hands regularly and have contact isolation. You should use face mask if you go, home, go out. Uh, briefly, it's, it's a topic in itself. Uh, BSG has, uh, uh, I'm glad has come up with uh, some very strict and clear endoscopic recommendations. Uh, we all want to help our patients, uh, and it is uh, it is tough times. But I think doctors' safety is paramount as well. Initially, BSG did not include the uh, gastroscopy as an aerosol generating procedure, but now they have been clear that gastroscopy and, in fact, all endoscopic procedures generate aerosols, and you should have strict uh, uh, strict uh, measures, aerosol generating measures, uh, as a caution. Uh, so COVID-19 is present in all GI secretions. All endoscopic procedures, particularly upper GI endoscopy is aerosol generating and all endoscopic procedures can have potential of transmitting the infections. 
On this basis, uh, BSG has come out uh, with this uh, notion where less is more, meaning that you should only be doing emergency and endoscopic procedures where the yield is high, and where they have uh, they have uh, divided into three three categories: where emergency or essential procedures like upper GI bleeding, varices bleed, acute uh, acute uh, obstruction due to foreign body or uh, or due to cancers or hepatobiliary like ERCPs for cholangitis and, and, and infected uh, wall uh, pancreatic collections needs to be trained. They should carry on, but all the rest of the endoscopic world at currently has been stopped. So basically, we're at the moment, um, the question really is about the cancer diagnostic work. In our hospital, we have stopped doing uh, diagnostic endoscopies and we're only aiming to do therapeutic endoscopies at, the, at present. I think with passage of time in coming weeks, uh, this paradigm might change uh, as, uh, as, as the pressure goes. And of course, we need to look after our patients as well. But if you do a diagnostic test, you need to see if you diagnose an upper GI cancer, what treatments you'll be able to offer. Will they be able to go and get surgery done? Will they be getting chemotherapy? And I think for next few weeks, the answer is no. So you would rather have a diagnosed cancer and sit with anxiety of that, or would you rather not have the test done in the first place? As I said, the, the safety of uh, the operator is uh, paramount, and you should uh, be able to divide your uh, or your patients in low, intermediate, and high-risk group. Uh, upper GI endoscopy uh, for de novo comes in the high-risk uh, category, and you should use proper PPE, which includes FFP2 or an N95 or F FFP3 mask. And, and the usual precautions of hair net, goggles, uh, face mask, and, and a gown. Now, there's lots of concerns about PPE, not only in, in Pakistan, it's all over the world. There's a shortage, and I think uh, uh, we all need to, to be cautious about that fact. And, and, and on that basis, I think the resource of mass is getting very precious. Uh, FTA has come up with the suggestion of reusing of N95 mask, and I particularly find this recommendation that you should have at least seven masks, and you do use on day one one mask, and then you should be able to store that in a in a container, aerated container, uh, for seven days, and you rotate mask on every seven days. The theory behind that is uh, as the COVID-19 maximum life expectancy on paper or plastic is maximum five days, so if you not use that, hopefully that will be dead by the time you reuse your mask. Um, some people leave them in their car because the heat of the sun, especially in countries like Pakistan, after while it will, uh, rays will be able to detoxify and kill the bugs. Uh, so at first I showed you the COVID cycle of death, and I think this is our cycle of survival. We need to make sure we we do our job as doctors, but at the same time, we are human beings and we should look after not our uh, ourselves, but also our colleagues. Uh, you should pair up with your colleagues, you should check with each other, uh, help each other. And that's the only way we're gonna survive this if we look after each other. Uh, and the important uh, point uh, very briefly I want to highlight is that don't stigmatize the patients. They need our help. Uh, any one of us can be on the side of the line. So someone has got COVID-19 infection, don't avoid them, try to help them, but keep your safety in, 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 in mind as well. So to, to summarize what new is, GI symptoms are common in COVID-19. It's not only a respiratory infection, it can involve multi-organs. Uh, GI symptoms can occur without respiratory symptoms, 10% percent of cases, first presentation is without fever. So fever is not necessarily a diagnostic criteria for COVID infection. Nausea and vomiting can be significant and can cause electrolyte and, de and dehydration. And people with COVID-19 with GI symptoms have worse clinical outcomes and mortality as compared to those who are not having GI symptoms, emphasizing the importance of symptoms like diarrhea to be included in diagnosing of COVID-19 early. Um, so finally, look after yourself and uh, look after your colleagues. Um, that's all I had to say. Uh, we are in the era of COVID-19. The other infections hasn't gone away. You still have Shigella. You will still have normal dysentery. So we need to use our common sense. Uh, important bit is what I found 
that if people have lost their smell and they have a bad taste and anorexia, these are highly predictive symptoms that they will develop temperature in 40 to 8 to 72 hours, suggesting they might have COVID infection. So keep that in mind. Uh, thank you very much to Get Swarma for giving this platform. Thank you, Dr. Sakib. I hope you can hear me. Yes, I can. Uh, well, quite an informative presentation, and you did present it very well. There were a few uh, complex slides, but you did manage, and you just uh, uh, passed the crux of that slide. So thank you so much again for that. Uh, I have a few questions so that uh, I have uh, my own self have a few questions, and then there are a few from the audience coming as well. Uh, you actually uh, already believed everything. So what I would do, I would try to ask questions in such a way that we were summarizing the whole presentation as well. So in the beginning, you said that there are around 40 to 45% patients who are presented with GI symptoms as well. So do you really think that uh, we can say that the GI symptoms could be the initial or the first symptoms of COVID-19? Can we rely on this? Yes, uh, I think that's now very much evident. Uh that uh, let me put that slide back. So basically it means that not only respiratory symptoms, but GI symptoms are also can be the presenting uh, uh, symptom of uh, COVID-19. And they could be along with respiratory symptoms as well. The problem is they cannot be, they might not be as profound as diarrhea and vomiting and severe abdominal pain. They could be as mild as just losing taste or smell or losing your taste of uh, uh, anorexia. So they could be early mild symptoms. So you have to be really cautious about them. And as I said, diarrhea vomiting is also a major symptom. So it's just uh, to keep an open mind of this. I think what's more important here is that we are seeing that OPDs are being shut down. So uh, normally if I talk about the scenario we are in, we are a development country, usually patient, when a patient is having diarrhea, they usually do self-medication. Uh, so that, that's another thing. But what should actually be the advice to the doctor who are seeing patient in this era that are having diarrhea? Should they be managed as a regular diarrhea or there should be some uh, changes in the treatment? Yes, I think that's very uh, practical and relevant question. Um, it's difficult to answer, but I think at this moment, especially in West, it's assumed that everyone will be a COVID patient unless proven otherwise. You should uh, see them. You should not avoid them but you should take your maximum precautions. Uh, it also depends on, on the severity of their symptom. Main, the management is supportive anyway, in any if it's a shigella or, or other dysentery or other common conditions, common conditions are still common first. So there's no harm in using the normal uh, treatment pathways for them. I would, avoid, I would avoid endoscoping these patients at just first presentation. I would uh, I would tell them to be very careful for the next 48 hours. They might develop more symptoms, as has been shown that most of these people will develop symptoms within 48 to 72 hours, which will be suggestive of COVID infection. So my practical advice will be make sure they're not dehydrated, they not have electrolyte abnormalities. Most likely try to manage them at home, avoid endoscopy. If you want to use metronidazole or other medications for common bugs, by all means, go ahead with that. It might be useful. But at the same time, avoid uh, scoping these patients and be vigilant and aware of them. Rather, for follow-up, I would suggest you should have a telephone or a teleclinic rather than physical interaction as much as. Uh, I think slide that was quite surprising for me where you actually shared the results from fecal RNA for COVID. And even after the swab, the nasal swab has been negative, uh, it stays positive for very long days. So, uh, can we have this uh, as a compulsory test uh, in such patients? Once they have been discharged, we should have some time period that after a week, a couple of days, the other day, you have to do a test again. Do you have any instructions? I think there's a problem in the practical aspect. It's the availability of tests, research or lab. I'm not sure if fecal RNA testing is widely available. Not even in UK, we're not doing it uh, as such. Practically, what we're doing is once they are asymptomatic after 14 days of isolation and 48 hours period when they've been asymptomatic, they've been deemed clear. But, but I think the aim of this slide is to make them vigilant and more cautious for their loved ones and family members that they should follow strict uh, hygiene protocols for another to be safe 30 days period. That's quite very uh, important actually to follow that. Uh, I have a question from Dr. Altaf Sheikh, and uh, he said that 
mainly the cause of morbidity in covid-19 is the hypoxic insult because of the attachment of porphyrin and displacing the heme so uh, the hypoxia will naturally be affecting the other organs as well so what's your comment on this yes i think this is another school of thought which is uh, very well being proven by post mortems as well so i think the respiratory injury is basically due to microvascular thrombosis uh, due to all the cytokines and mast cell releasing various stuff and now there's been a theory proposed that ventilating these patients is probably not doing a that many good and they should be treated by having frequent blood transfusions plasma pheresis and plasma therapy so i think it's a, it's a valid uh, valid thought uh, the problem is that a lot of these things are not evidence based and in such environment in pandemic the evidence will be as good as it will be so i think um, on your respiratory or ic consultant can answer whether the ventilation is the right approach for them or not obviously they will need respiratory support whether they all should have blood transfusion and manage hypoxia without a fall in hp by the parameters we know i don't know if i can answer that question at the moment okay uh, you also talk about the chronic gi conditions like ibd and crohn so uh, what what's your key message here for the icps who are managing such patient how should they proceed Such- so the key key message is these patients should, uh, if they can afford, they should self isolate, uh, follow strict isolation measures. They should continue their medications. They are, if you can get their steroids down less than twenty milligram, which is shown and proven, that will be useful. If they are having a flare, then treat as normally you would. I would tend not to use very high doses of steroids, but get them if possible early vedolizumab or stekimab if they reach that stage. uh the key is that um, we don't know there's no clear guideline about covid colitis there have been only a couple of cases so it's not thankfully a major cause for flare of ibd at the moment so i think we can keep our fingers crossed on that so less less steroid use more isolation good hygiene i think these all measures we haven't seen ibd as a increased cohort of patients getting covid uh, uh, covid 19 infection so that's the good news i think you uh, i was about to ask a question regarding the recommended use of oral i oral or iv steroids uh, we we are actually a developing country so uh, you said that the the quantity should be used uh, should be less than the usual well that's the recommendation of this rand group which has been published in gastroenterology i i, I think recommendations are recommendations you have to use your own and on the ground ground realities as well or you have to keep the balance whether you can treat the flare by that dose or what state of flare is whether they have got distal colitis or pan colitis whether you, they can get away with topical steroids like uh, steroid enemas uh, whether they can have uh, more safer steroids like cortimen which is only a form of budesonide which is only effective in colon and has minimal systemic absorption so those kind of steroids are more safer than prednisone itself you can use higher doses but i think in that case i would ask isolate them and have a strict precautions and measures placed like using gloves uh face mask when uh, when interacting with the people even household should wear face mask as well and uh, i think it's it's, uh, it's a balance between disease and the control okay uh, any kind of change when you are managing a liver injury patient or something or some patient who is having hepatitis b or c no currently any i think there's uh, sorry complicated can you any changes in the management that you would like to suggest or it should be continued the same way no i think the management of hepatitis b and c is should carry on as we are doing there's no there's no data to suggest that they are increased risk of having covid-19 and if they do have covid-19 there's no data to suggest that they are increased risk of having comorbidity or death unless they have got the compensated liver so i think uh, neither the hepatitis b or c medication or or infection itself increases the risk of having covid 19 okay but another interesting question that is regarding the re- reuse of n95 mask uh, usually we are attending the routine patient so uh, we don't know the status of the covid patient so what should be done in such cases uh, what i know is that the life cycle of uh, n95 is around 3 days so can it be reused can it be uh, used after wash or maybe more longer than 3 days so that's why i put the slide in i think 
at the moment we so there are certain conditions so never wash your n95 because that will destroy the filter as well as it will deform the mask uh, what they recommend is mask rotation or uh, hydrogen peroxide vaporization to to help reusing the mask rotation is a simple concept that you have five to seven masks and you use one day and then save the other for for the seven day rotations because the lifespan maximum is three to five days as long as mask is in shape it's not got wet or soiled you can reuse a uh, reuse that uh, as long as is, you can i think it's better to do that rather than not having masks uh, at the moment they are like gold dust uh second the thing is what to i tend to do especially when you're on on the ward or opds where there's going to be close contact we use double mask so on n95 you put a normal surgical mask on it uh which is which are which are cheaper so if there is any bigger aerosols or viruses they will mainly mainly get on the front mask and when you go or you finish your day you throw the front mask and save the the n95 mask uh what's your advice for doctors who are working in private clinics i have a question from one of the participant that should they be kept close uh because uh, they are not able to take all the precautionary measures and as you know in our practices most of the patient are reported in private clinics rather than the government hospital so uh, how should they proceed yeah no i think that is uh, that is a big challenge uh, obviously one is the economic aspects of this uh Uh, it's economic loss uh, and there's also a loss of healthcare which a lot of people subscribe in countries like pakistan because the lack of uh, government funded uh, care no i think you have to adapt uh, you can simple measures like uh, at the front door checking temperatures of the people coming uh, although it's not 100% but you can screen some people who will have certain infection before they come into the clinic you can have uh, screens play in place uh, for your protection if you have a big a bigger room you should uh, arrange your clinic arrangements as such that there should be at least uh, you know 6 feet difference between a doctor and a patient uh, you should avoid doing unnecessary examinations we never do unnecessary but what i mean to say is that the yield of examination for example if you're going to get a chest x-ray done there's no point in exoskeletating that chest at that setting Uh, if you don't take me wrong i think these measures will help you should use frequent wash as uh, hand washings between the patients and you should use a face screen as well as a mask i think at the moment the challenge is that this is an indefinite scenario and we cannot stop working just on this basis a lot of people need our help so we should not stigmatize and uh, and punish the patients but we should adapt the maximum approach and safety measures the safety measures are very simple and i think uh, it's not too much to take to adapt them is the awareness we need to create um, in the general public you can certainly switch to teleclinics uh, if that helps in that scenario but i'm not sure how effective that will be in country in pakistan i agree i uh, we need to actually educate the public uh, right now uh, even if the scps are willing to take the precautionary measures there's some kind of uh, uh things that are uncontrollable at the public end uh second last question uh one of the participant asked that for how long the patient will be shedding the covid uh, uh, dna in feces so the study which i showed you from uh, in the lancet um, let me get the slides so from there the average duration of fecal shedding is about 15 days uh the maximum duration in there one patient had for, for 47 days but i think on once their nasal swabs are negative it's shown that from 10 to 14 days after getting negative nasal swabs they they will have on average shedding of viruses in the feces so that's why they have come with the safe number of about 27 to 30 days they should be cautious after getting better for their own benefit and for the benefit of their family the, if they can you know just basic hygiene measures flushing toilet with closed lid or flushing the excreta washing hands use some basic uh, caustic soda or or toilet agents to clear the and prevent uh, vaporization make sure is the toilets are well ventilated and clean i think that's 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 really you can do okay uh, so to the last thing uh, it's not a question is actually advised that what uh, i would like you to say to the scps that are working in pakistan 
being in UK and practicing there, uh, we know that the scenario there is quite worse. It's a developed country with a very strong health system. So what should be the advice to HCPs as some rising message? So I think um, obviously the grass is always green on the other side of the picture, but I can reassure you that Pakistan is doing a very good job in controlling. The problem with PPE is everywhere. Uh, in fact, uh, if you read the newspapers now, UK is about to run today out, out of gowns and masks and face masks. In my own hospital, I couldn't find any scrubs to wear. So, so the problems are common. As I said, my cycle of survival is that you have to look after each other. Don't stigmatize the patients and try to do your best. I think everyone is trying their best. But simple measures like um, my colleague from Hong Kong told me some very basic measures which you can adapt to protect yourself and family. For example, his protocol was that he used to change in his garage. He goes to the hospital and change into different clothes, work there, leave those clothes at hospital, change into his clothes, come to garage and then change in other clothes, straight to the washroom, have a shower and then meet the family. Don't take shoes into the hospital, shoes into your home. So these simple measures, washing, keep washing your hands, avoid touching your face and try to do your best. I think we all in the same boat. We will only survive this if we look after each other rather than having an individual approach. At the same time, we should try not to harm the patients as well. I completely agree. You, I think the this. I think we need the teamwork here. And uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Sakib, for so much information that you shared, the knowledge, the experience, the current scenario that UK is facing, and how we can proceed. Uh, we wish you all the best, and uh, we wish uh, uh, that the people in UK will be safe as well, and uh, wish you safety as well. Uh, because uh, you are the frontline soldier who's every day exposing with those patients. So uh, stay safe. And thank you so much. Anything that you would like to say to get some more uh, about this webinar? Uh, no, I think it's, it's been a pleasure. And uh, I think Gets is doing a wonderful job by disseminating the knowledge and bringing the, the community together. I think it's very useful. And hopefully the happy times will return when we'll meet physically as well. And thank Inshallah. you for providing this uh, forum for uh, talking to colleagues. We will surely be engaging you in uh, our future session as well. So we can have the learning experience of the UK directly as well. Thank you so much. Thank Thanks you, so Allah Thank you.